everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today is going to be a long anticipated video, which is a PhD Q&A. So I asked on Instagram earlier this week, what are some burning questions you have about science, about academia, about me doing my PhD? And I got so many good questions. So let's start from the beginning. The first one says, what are your plans post PhD? So I think this is a great question. It's also one that my parents asked me. I would say that there's two very classical, you know, paths you can take with a PhD. First, you go into academia. So you do a postdoctorate or postdoc. Um, basically, you just work more independently. You publish a lot more and then you apply for professorships. Uh, as you can tell from my tone, that's not really the route I'm most excited about just because I love science and I love research, but I don't love academia as an institution. And I also don't love the way that you have to push yourself so hard so that you can maybe have a tenure position, which is very rare, by the way. The second path then is doing industry, kind of just refers to like a job in the industry. Actually a lot of positions now which are research focused, um, but there's also jobs where you can work in pharmaceuticals, you can work at a startup, um, like a biotech startup, you can uh, work in consulting, consulting on things. Um, I'm actually not sure what consultants do. <laughs> then there's a lot of more untraditional paths. So for example, my husband's sister just graduated with a PhD in neuroscience and now she works in science education. So basically teaching teenagers or undergrads about science and getting them more interested in research as well. What am I planning on doing? I'm not sure. So I still have a couple of years left of my degree and I'm hoping that that becomes more clear as I prepare to graduate. But I'm also kind of under the impression that I will never regret getting a PhD, you know? Even if I end up doing something that's not purely research focused, I think that's fine. Like the PhD itself is a very valuable experience. It's a very valuable certification. So I will always be doctor. Well, knock on wood that I actually graduate. How long is your PhD gonna take? I'm about to enter my third year. It's technically supposed to be a five year program, but a lot of people take six, maybe even up to seven. Do you ever feel imposter syndrome? And how do you deal with it? PhD is so full of this. So of course I feel imposter syndrome. I think everyone I've ever met, even the most genius you know, kids, feel imposter syndrome. And how I push through it is kind of just taking a step back and realizing I applied and I got in, you know, that must count for something. That must mean that even though I believe in myself, someone else also believes in me enough to think that I could finish my thesis. While I have a lot of shortcomings, um, that's what I'm trying to improve while I'm in school. If you already knew everything, you would need to go to school, you know? So everyone comes in with shortcomings and their strengths. I would say mine are that um, I need to be more organized, maybe better time management. Like my strengths are that I'm very good at abstract thinking and I learn things very quickly. Going into it, I know that I'm capable and I deserve to be there. And obviously there's moments where you're gonna feel like you're out of place. Um, and on a very superficial level, I think you just remind yourself that you deserve to be there. Obviously, there's also systemic issues that lead into imposter syndrome. Like if you are a woman or a minority, like you just haven't had as many people show you that that's where you belong. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Do you experience bias as a STEM PhD who embraces femininity, especially dressing up to lab? I think that's a great question because obviously I present myself as very feminine um, and the answer is no. I've had a lot of good luck in terms of the fact that I found advisors or colleagues who don't care about that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's really like dumb if you think about it to discriminate against someone based on what they wear. And also I feel like I've been especially lucky because my lab is mostly women. And I also feel like, yeah, like my professors are just too smart to be judging me on what I wear. Do you know what I mean? Obviously that's not to say that misogyny doesn't exist. It very much is rampant in STEM. And I'm sure there's a lot of horror stories out there and I've heard a lot of horror stories. However, I myself have been um, very fortunate. Do you ever feel exploited by academia? Well, yes. Well, yes. Okay. But academia is inherently exploitative. You know, the system in which we have built is kind of arbitrary. Like who said that this was the path you're supposed to 
take to become the most developed scientist you can be. And I would say as a grad student, you know, I'm definitely not earning a lot of money. So I get paid a stipend to attend school because I'm producing work. I'm producing research for my university. Definitely not something that you go into if you want to be making money. It's something you do if you really love science and are passionate about it. And of course, with that being said, um, I think it's very much up to us to try to change the system so that it's less exploitative. How did you manage to get a PhD position? I desperately need to know. So I'm guessing that this is someone who wants to apply for a PhD. And I'll kind of just run through my little path to a PhD. So when I was in my last year of undergrad, I really didn't want to go to grad school. It was actually COVID and so I just gone home and I just really didn't see myself pushing through four more years of school because I feel like I didn't enjoy my undergrad as much as I enjoy grad school. So I feel like I'm not a great test taker. And obviously I went to a huge undergrad. It's all tests, you know, it's all multiple choice tests. I feel like I had a lot of great ideas and when they let me write out my ideas, I would get an A in class. But then when I was forced to take an exam, I would often get too nervous. Um, or like I wasn't very good at memorizing. I wasn't planning on doing grad school at all. And my boyfriend at the time, Eli, um, knew he wanted to do a PhD and we wanted to move in together. So in my mind, I was like, well, I guess I'll give it a shot. I'll try to apply to grad school um, and maybe we get to move to the same city together. It's pretty obvious and transparent, especially when you're writing like a personal statement to a university, if you're interested or not. And I feel like I probably was not showing the same enthusiasm. I applied to a couple grad schools, didn't get in, um, but Eli got into Columbia and we decided to move to New York. So I knew that I was really qualified for research jobs and I applied to a couple. I cold emailed professors and I did a couple of interviews until someone accepted me. As I was doing that RA ship, I fell more and more in love with doing research and I saw what grad school was actually like. You know, it was nothing that I had imagined. About a year and a half in, I applied to the uh, PhD cycle. I ended up applying only to New York schools. I got interviews from Cornell, NYU, Columbia, the school I'm currently in, and I was at the end choosing between Columbia Biomedical Engineering or the program I'm currently in. I think that as you're writing your personal statement, your passion will show through. Gain enough experience, lab experience, then you can really put it down on paper of why a PhD makes sense to you and just speak as authentically as possible. Do you have comprehensive exams? So in my PhD program in particular, we have a qualifying exam at the end of your second year, which I'm about to do. And after you do that, you become a PhD candidate. So right now I'm a student and you become a candidate. This one's just a funny and silly one. How do you afford to live in New York City like Harry Bradshaw on a PhD student budget? <laughs> Sorry, I just, that one got a cackle out of me. So maybe I'm just really, really good at pretending on Instagram, but I'm definitely not living like Harry Bradshaw. My apartment, which I think is the thing that takes up most people's monthly budget, is super cheap because we live in subsidized housing for students. So transparently, I only pay $1,000 a month for my rent and utilities, and Wi-Fi, and everything. And I only take the subways. I either bike everywhere or I'm on the subway. And I also don't spend as much money as you think. Um, I think a lot of my clothing is gifted or I buy it on eBay. And I prioritize all of my money on travels or uh, eating good food. So all of those things that you see me do that are fun on the internet, um, those are things I prioritize spending money on and then everything else I feel like I'm pretty frugal. So I got a lot of questions basically uh, along the same vein about how I balance work with life. And I think that that's a great question for literally anybody. Um, but I know that you guys see me do other things beyond just working in the lab every day. So I wanted to address that. I often call my job nine to five. And this is specifically curated because I knew I wanted really good work-life balance. So what I mean by this is that depending on which lab, which professor you work for, what question you've been looking at, your life is gonna look really different. So for example, when I used to work in mice, I would have to go in on the weekends because I needed to go give the mice water or check in on them because we had weeks long experiments. But now I work in bacteria, so much easier by the way. So you can just plan it so that you show up at you know 10, leave at six, 
go for a break, whatnot. It's really just more up to you. You have more freedom when you do molecular biology versus working with animals. I think that you can be a very productive and successful scientist and still have a life, you know? Got a lot of questions on what are your research interests and um, what field are you in? When I was an undergrad, I did my honors undergraduate thesis in a lab that studied cell mechanobiology, so the mechanics of how cells move. And this kind of was the intersection between biology and physics. Then I moved on to becoming a research assistant. I actually like, didn't really specify which field necessarily that I wanted my job to be in. I ended up researching memories and how short-term memories become consolidated into long-term memories. And the lab itself is very, very like pure neuroscience. Um, and I was on the systems neuroscience half of the lab. So a lot of my days were spent doing uh, brain surgery on mice, and implanting lenses. Um, we built up a virtual reality setup to look at single neurons firing as a mouse was doing a behavior and kind of correlate that to do they remember being in this virtual reality room or another. So I thought that was super fascinating and I would have loved to stay in neuroscience as well. When I did my three rotations at the beginning of my PhD, I did one in mechanobiology, one in neuroscience, and the last one was microbiology. And the lab I ended up joining was obviously this microbiology one. And it was kind of random. I just wanted like a rotation I had never done before. It was supposed to be a really fun one before I went on summer vacation for a little bit. And I ended up just really loving it. And I really admired my professor as well, my PI, my coworkers. Um, and again, a lot of factors go into play when you are deciding which lab you wanna be in for a PhD. It's not necessarily just the questions itself. Of course, you have to be interested in whatever research you're doing but also like we're humans you know we are social animals i want to be somewhere where i can really get along with the people i work with where i have a lot of joy coming into work every day where we can eat lunch together where i can have a really good conversation with my professor where they understand where i'm coming from where um they have a lot of empathy for me those are all factors that go into play do you ever think about doing a combined md phd so yes i have thought about doing an md phd and for those of you who don't know basically you apply to a program in which you do two years in med school you take a quick break quick break for four years and you complete your phd before you return back to med school to finish up your medical degree and you graduate with a phd as well so with that you can go on to a traditional residency and become a doctor you can do a postdoc and try to go that academic route. You can be a physician scientist in which you are um, a practicing physician, but you also have your own lab where you're probably doing research related to your specialty. I've definitely thought about it because a lot of my coworkers, a lot of my friends, are in those programs it has crossed my mind but i don't think that i'm that passionate about practicing medicine unfortunately i think it's really cool to think about human health or disease but it's just not what gets me you know going and i would say that i'm a lot more interested in basic research how do you balance a dressing cute with wearing ppe ppe is personal protective equipment um and the truth is i don't really but it's also very very specific to what kind of lab you work in so if you work in a chemistry lab Please, please wear, you know, like long pants, cover up shoes, a lab coat, etc., etc. I don't work with anything that can kill me, thank God. And I don't really work with any hazardous chemicals at all. Um, I'll occasionally wear a lab coat if I'm doing something very sensitive. Most of the time, you'll see in research labs, everyone's kind of just wearing their normal clothes. Not to say that I'm not wearing something like a little bit more crazy on the day to day, because that's my passion. You know, I love dressing up. Uh, even if it's only a couple people that will see it per day. Last question, do you turn down new projects to accommodate your extracurricular interests? I truly believe that school is really important and this was drilled into me from such a young age and at the end of the day, I will always prioritize school. So I love creating. I love being online and sharing you know, my interests, my, my style, my little outfits. But if it comes down to it, I will always choose my PhD. I really care about this and it's very serious and I don't take it lightly. So with that, I think I'll end the video here. Thank you so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe. Leave comments below if you have any more questions and I'll try my best to answer them. And thank you so much for listening to me ramble on and on. I hope you learned uh, something about the world of academia or PhDs or about me. All right, bye.